Welcome to part three of Alexandra Mayer's in-depth analysis and commentary of John Ronson's The Last Days of August. View parts one and two on PornNewsToday.com. Warning, this commentary does include spoilers. Everyone effing lies. They are the most uneducated, shady, criminal effing people I ever engaged with. A quote from Lisa Ann to John Ronson at the one hour, 54 minute mark in regards to her view of the people who the pornography industry is comprised of. So that's the thing. She's willing to say something so horrific about her peers, but she won't walk away from them. I wonder why. One hour, 58 minute mark. Lisa Ann states she believes the last days of August will trigger more suicides. Initially, I thought the same, but today I don't. In fact, this just may be the most entertaining and honest podcast I ever heard, but maybe only because I once dealt with the jerks. Um, there's no way that this podcast will trigger more suicides. What this podcast has done is throw the doors wide open in regards to the personality types that the porn industry is comprised of. And, um, the light that is being shown on those personality types, it's not very flattering, but it's real. And again, I think that this is a podcast that any individual should listen to in its entirety before dealing in any capacity with the porn industry. At the two hour and six minute mark, John Ronson outlined specifically how Kevin Moore utilizes divide and conquer tactics to attempt to control and manipulate social situations and people. Very astute observation of a certain type of pimp mentality. Yeah, I've encountered um, men linked to and within the porn industry who utilize those exact same types of tactics. Dave of the Luxury Companion, Sean Matthew Tompkins, a.k.a. TRPWL, Ari Scott Bass, a.k.a. Michael Whiteacre, and the list goes on. But um, Kevin Moore specifically does it quite well. And when I do look at how he politicized his wife's death to create a massive chasm within the adult entertainment industry, meaning gay versus straight, um, it, it points to him having a certain kind of mind. And like I said, I believe that he's on the spectrum. But I also think that um, he has a certain agenda, a very dangerous agenda, which I'm glad is being addressed in the last days of August. It's odd John Ronson couldn't find many in the porn industry who knew Hunter Bryce because a ton of people knew her and were aware that she was close to James Bartolet of Galaxy Publicity. I smell another death cover-up. Hunter Bryce was someone who Kevin dated for quite some time, and she, as well, is dead. And uh, John Ronson does relate that he couldn't seem to find anybody who knew much about her. And I find that strange because, you know, I'm... I'm almost certain Bartolet of Galaxy Publicity would have known that John Ronson was doing this project because that man has his finger on the pulse of everything within the adult entertainment world, but he doesn't come forward in regards to her. Now, when Hunter died, there was some controversy and scandal surrounding her death, which was um, linked to a porn star known as Tucker Slain, who uh, I think was one of the last people to interact with her. And Tucker Slain was put through hell. I remember when it happened. I actually interviewed him. And um, Tucker was blamed 
And I don't think that was right. The whole situation actually reminds me a bit of how Jackson Wheeler was blamed. And uh, a lot of people knew Hunter Bryce. I met her on a uh, publicity shoot that I participated in when I was with James Bartolet's uh, publicity agency, Galaxy. It was some sort of a promotional spot. I can't re- remember what for, but that was the day that I met a um, black porn star from a few decades ago known as Jeannie Pepper. And Hunter was there that day. So was another girl known as uh, Angelita Valentine. But it should have been fairly easy to find someone who knew Hunter Bryce. But I don't think anyone wanted to come forward. That's what I think. Two hour, 14 minute mark. A guy named Ryan McLean outlines a suicide attempt August had that resulted in her having to be taken to the hospital. But Kevin labels the incident a nervous breakdown. Too bad Ryan wasn't brave enough to tell her he loved her. Yeah, that was a little interesting diversion in the uh, podcast. The entrance of Ryan McLean. I think Ryan McLean was very honest about what he observed between Kevin and August. And I think that August really um, felt that Ryan was a true friend. Uh, What's interesting about the fact that August had a suicide attempt prior to her death is that it parallels something very similar that Shazia Sahari went through, which we learn about later in the podcast. It's almost like um, the two women were one and the same. They weren't, but their experiences with Kevin were very similar. Two hour, 30 minute mark. Shazia Sahari is located. Two hour, 37 minute mark. Shazia Sahari goes into detail about Derek Hay and his abusive, unethical behavior. Her parents tried to save her from porn by institutionalizing her. Her parents felt Kevin pulled their daughter into porn. And he kind of did. Um, so Lisa Ann, she did get her wish. She did because um, we learn a lot about Derek Hay of LA Direct Models from Shazia Sahari. Um, And what she says is horrific in the way that Derek Hay regarded and treated her. I don't think that he should be an agent. Not at all, because he doesn't seem to know his place. But what we hear from Shazia in regards to her parents' intervention, that actually parallels what Jean Ross wrote about in regards to Veronica Lynn's mother when Veronica was dating Kevin. So Kevin Moore pretty much completely lied to John Ronson about Shazia Sahari. He was not a good husband to her, emotionally abusive. I'm glad she got away from him and performing in pornography. Yeah. Um, In the podcast, Kevin Moore does paint a completely different picture of Shazia than what seems to be the reality. And that's not good. It makes me wonder, you you know, how much does he twist reality when it comes to other things in his life? Two hour, 42 minute mark. Shazia at one point attempted suicide while married to Kevin Moore as well. He had become emotionally distant They were more like roommates from her perspective, opposed to husband and wife. Yeah, and that's, you know, again, that's why I think that um, he's on that autism spectrum, because it seems that he's good at playing a certain role to an extent, but then he gets tired. I think that a lot of males in the industry actually relate very well to Kevin Moore because he is so emotionally distant 
2 hour 44 minute mark. Shazia Sahari's suicide attempt story directly parallels that of August's attempt that Ryan McLean shared. Kevin didn't visit her in the hospital immediately either. 2 hour 45 minute mark. Shazia Sahari relates how she heard she could supplement her income as a porn actress by escorting and she states Kevin facilitated her to do it. She says he drove her to a john while they were married. Shazia backed out at the last minute. Yeah. That right there told me pretty much everything that I need to know about Kevin Moore. He married a girl, claimed to love her, and then thought it was okay to drive her to meet a John to do an escort gig. That's not a good guy. That's not a good husband. That's not a good anything. Shazia Sahari also claims that Kevin Moore was basically in control of her no list, not too unlike what various parties stated about August. That all contradicts Kevin's it's your body, it's your choice mantra. Two hour, 55 minute mark. An analogy to baby elephants in the circus is made by a female adult producer. Excellent metaphor in regards to the psychological conditioning adult performers often undergo. Wow. And I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, It's a producer in the industry who's a female who did not want to be named that John Ronson interviewed in regards to August and her relationship with Kevin. And um, she related one of the best analogies I think I've ever heard when it comes to how a lot of female porn stars feel. She essentially said that in the circus, baby elephants are often chained to where they can't get away. And as they grow, they essentially theoretically could break the chains, but because they were conditioned as babies to think that they couldn't, they don't even try. So I think that what this female producer is saying was, you know, there's a lot of females in the industry who, when they come in, they feel suppressed and stifled. But as they grow and as they develop, they do have the power within to be able to break free and go their own way, but they don't because they don't believe that they can. At the three hour mark, those with a fairly trained ear can hear Kevin's voice crack a bit upon John Ronson inquiring as to the events involving the electrical outage the night August was found dead. This being an audio-only podcast reveals a lot, and it does, because you can tell in the podcast when Kevin is basically spewing lines that he's probably gone over in his head over and over and over again to various questions that he's anticipating, opposed to questions that he wasn't anticipating. Three hour, three minute mark. Though Kevin Moore claimed the power was out in his residence for hours the night August died, the California Power Company's official report does not corroborate that. The company claims the power was out less than half an hour. And um, that report that Ronson obtained does directly contradict what Kevin Moore wrote as his initial statement upon August Ames passing. Three hour and six minute mark. August's brother states his focus in regards to her death is on Kevin Moore, Marcus Dupree, and Jackson Wheeler, not Jessica Drake. August's brother does not seem to fault bullying for her death. And again, I highly um, encourage a lot of you to look at the Porn News Today Live podcast, 
prior to this one because I do go extensively into how Jackson Wheeler never should have been utilized as a scapegoat. Three hours, seven minute mark. August's brother is pissed. He wrote a letter to Kevin he hadn't sent saying, quote, how dare you blame bullying for her death, end quote. He also says he refuses to believe her death was a suicide and he's based his opinion of Kevin on what August told him. I truly hope that August's brother finds peace. I can understand his anger. And um, I don't think that we have heard the final end of this particular situation just yet. At the three hour, 10 minute mark, it's revealed that August's entire family is a military family. If Mercedes Carrera knew that, now I understand why she may have been fixated on befriending August. But would that have altered August's outcome? We'll never know. But upon learning that detail in the podcast, I completely understand why Mercedes Carrera felt so drawn to becoming a part of this project, The Last Days of August, and why she may have wanted to become friends with August because they had a similar upbringing. And sometimes you do need friends who have a similar background to yourself. Three hour, 16 minute mark. August's final scene is described. It's never been released. The situation sounds like it was too much, in my opinion, for what she could deal with at that phase of her life, even if she'd done rough sex scenes before. She wasn't into it. And to expand on that, I think that the only reason she went through with the scene was an attempt to please Kevin. That's really what I think. Because he hadn't put Marcus Dupree on her no list, had he? Three hour, 19 minute mark. August's last agent, Chris Kane, relates he'd been concerned about Kevin Moore and August Ames' relationship as Kevin didn't seem to like people. He states it himself too and was an introvert, whereas August was an extrovert by nature. I'm glad that they interviewed her agent because... um, He was more than her agent, it seems. It seems like he was a bit of her confidant, too. And um, I just find it, I find it so disturbing that Kevin did, it seems, take efforts to physically separate himself and August from really the... um, porn industry community I think he was living like an hour out away from the valley and uh, he just seemed to uh, really view August as his property the whole thing just kind of makes my skin crawl seems to me Kevin had the dominant personality which didn't allow August to be herself she was a people pleaser in my opinion And I'm thinking the only reason she submitted to the rough scene with Marcus Dupree was to validate Kevin's judgment. Three hour, 22 minute mark. August's agent claims August stated she loved Kevin more, but wasn't in love with him. He says she was going to ask him for a divorce. Claims August felt like she and Kevin were living two entirely separate lives. In my opinion, she outgrew him. Yeah. Because when you listen to Kevin's voice, and I'm not talking about the tone, but I'm talking about just um, his speech patterns. He doesn't sound like a uh, man in his 40s to me. From my perspective, he sounds more like a guy about 25, because I think it was probably around 25 that he became a bit emotionally halted. I think that he's a very emotionally stunted man. And um, even though August, it seems, had her issues, she was growing up. 
and she wanted more. She wanted an emotional relationship. And if he wouldn't give her that divorce, that would have definitely added to a lot of what she was contending with psychologically, probably spiritually as well. Three hour, 23 minute mark. According to August's agent, Chris, Kevin wanted to do family therapy rather than grant her a divorce. She did ask him, according to Chris. Um, Another thing I want to touch on, August Ames was not American. She was Canadian. And I think that the fact that um, she wasn't American was a factor when it came to her marriage to Kevin. And I think that Kevin um, might have utilized that as leverage to try to keep her with him. And that's not right. Can't do that. At the three hour, 32 minute mark, John Ronson brings up the reality directly to Kevin Moore via phone about the issue of psychologically damaged young women, 18 to late 20s, being manipulated by psychologically damaged old men, 40 and older in the porn industry. At the three hour, 33 minute mark, Kevin Moore states, I don't think there's anything wrong with sex or pornography, but I think the business is very sick. There's the reality that for 20 years, I've lived a life that I kind of regret now. Three hour, 33 minute mark. Kevin Moore continues by saying, we are making a living off the backs of the mentally ill. I personally don't agree. I feel over half the time it's the mentally ill predators or sociopaths making a living off the naive and submissive in porn. Um, Lots of deflection coming from Kevin, in my opinion, at the very end. But uh, what he says is very telling. Maybe he's even talking about himself when he talks about making money off the backs of the mentally ill because he was a performer at one point. I hope that Kevin listens to the last days of August because it's kind of a, hey, this is your life sort of project when it comes to who he is as a person. I believe everybody can improve. Everybody can change. But you have to be able to really look at yourself in the mirror before you can become the best version of yourself. So um, that's about it. I just wanted to share my analysis of the last days of August. I think that John Ronson did a spectacular job on the project. It's very stylish. I'm a fan now. I'm going to have to listen to more of his audiobooks. But um, I think I listened to this particular piece at the perfect time of my life because it did bring up some old thoughts and feelings that I hadn't had about that world in quite some time. But for me, the last days of August was incredibly healing because it made me realize when it came to certain personality types that I encountered who made me feel a certain way about myself, I now realize that um, the problem was not me. Not at all. So thanks everyone for watching another podcast of Porn News Today Live. Once more, I'm Alex Mayers. Bye-bye.